Namaskar and welcome to episode number 17 of the Indology podcast. There is one thing I have seen and heard many Pakistanis say is that it wasn't long ago that Pakistan was more prosperous than India, that they were doing so much better than India at least economically. Many of them even believe that this emergence of India has been a thing only for the last few years and these few years uh, differ depending on who you speak to some say it's 15 years some say 10 years some even say 5 years which of course is not true it's not really true that pakistan was so much better economically it was mostly that we were so much worse off because of the socialist policies the absolutely insane amount of corruption nepotism and just one particular family ruling the whole country so it isn't that they were so great it's mostly because we were so bad but if you tell this to a pakistani he she is not going to believe you so i wondered if there was some source of information which we could use to determine this truth for once and for all and and luckily i remembered this book called among the believers which was written by v s naipaul vidyadhar suraj prasad naipaul a writer of indian origin born in trinidad and tobago and later became a british citizen his insights on the indian subcontinent are particularly fantastic even though they might at times present us the harsh reality of our own land and of our own people so he wrote this book uh, among the believers when he traveled across the muslim world and he wrote about how people practiced uh, islam the things he saw the things he encountered he wrote very honestly about these things and today i thought i'll read some excerpts from this book for you especially the parts relating to pakistan now this book was published in 1981 which according to most pakistanis was a time when there was utopia and economic prosperity in pakistan so through the eyes of mr naipaul who's a neutral we get a very clear idea of what pakistan was at that point what was the religious situation like what were the people like and is it much different from what it is today Naipaul writes Pakistan had a high reputation in the Muslim world it was the 20th century islamic pioneer and for some time there had been reports of its experiments with islam pakistan it was said was experimenting with islamic law with a quranic arms levy that would eventually sustain an islamic welfare state and with a banking system that would do away with interest I wanted to have a look at these experiments but after a few days in Karachi it became clear that I needed help that by myself I would see nothing so I went to see Mr Deen the government information officer his office was in a concrete shed in what looked like old british military barracks off a wide central corridor a bar room style swing door led to Mr Deen's room The cotton carpet was worn its red and white pattern faded with dust and sun the distempered walls were ochre colored flaking erupting with lime the windows of the roughest carpentry were protected by a diamond pattern metal grill and someone was running a scooter just outside creating a tearing noise in a cloud of blue smoke two small windows cut into the top of the wall were meant to let out hot air and a ceiling fan spun over a cold government issue sofa set which as i found out when i sat down was a little rickety government on a shoestring and mr deen was bemused by my request he had been courteous to me he had sent the office van to fetch me from the hotel but he was a busy man he was concerned that morning with the pilgrims going to mecca the government had decreed that to be a matter of importance and he was going through the official photographs of the scenes at the docks the previous day it was clear that mr deen was finding some of the photographs unsatisfactory people talk about these things mr deen said with the weariness of a harassed official but the people who talk expect other people to do the work there was an islamic ideology council that met 10 days a month but that was in islamabad the capital far to the north mr deen did not know what he could do for me in karachi he was in his mid 50s he wore gray trousers and a white shirt mr shirwani a colleague came in he was heavy looser in flesh than mr deen his skin was smooth 
and he was wearing a short-sleeved sports shirt. Mr. Dean explained what I was after, and Mr. Shirwani looked hard at me. He said to Mr. Dean in Urdu, but he looks just like Kutub. When I came in the room, I thought, but it is Kutub. Mr. Dean looked at me with a new interest and said with sad affection that yes, I looked like Kutub. Kutub, they told me, was a Pakistani painter. Mr. Shirwani said, How old are you? I said, 47. I am 48, and I'm healthier than you. No, you can't deny it. Your eyes are tired. They are the eyes of an old man. That indicates a vitamin deficiency. Mr. Dean said, He wants to see Islam in action. I thought Mr. Dean put it well. Mr. Shirwani said, He should read the Quran. I clung to Mr. Dean's good words. I said, I want to see Islam in action. Mr. Shirwani said that many people said they were Muslims, but there were very few true Muslims. Islam was a complete way of life, and for that reason, was too hard for most people. I mentioned Iran. Mr. Shirwani said with immense fatherly tolerance that the Shias of Iran were a deviation. Mr. Shirwani asked whether I had any religious faith. I said I hadn't, and to my surprise, he was delighted. He said it meant I wasn't prejudiced. It was important in studying Islam not to be prejudiced. Mr. Shirwani said to me, A man like you, I'm going to make a prophecy about you. When you have finished your investigations, you will become a Muslim. Mr. Dean, his handsome face still full of cares of the office, smiled at me. And then he and Mr. Shirwani began to discuss what could be done for me. I heard ideology counsel a few times. I felt that I was imposing on both of them, taking up their time with a non-official matter. But Mr. Dean said, it makes a change from what journalists here usually want us to do for them. And so the two of them talked on. How could they demonstrate Islam to a visitor? Pilgrims, they decided. In the morning, another pilgrim ship was going to Jeddah. Officers from the department would be going to cover the event and I could go with them. Mr. Shirwani thought it was a very good idea. Unless I saw and talked to the pilgrims going to Mecca, I wouldn't understand the depth of their faith. And mosques, they decided. I should visit the mosques of Karachi that evening. No evening could be better, Mr. Shirwani said, because this was the night in Ramzan, when in 610 AD, the Prophet received his first revelation. Prayers offered on this night were worth a thousand times more than on other nights. In Shia Iran, Ramzan was a month of mourning, full of the calamities of the Shia heroes who had failed to be recognized as the Prophet's successors. For the Sunni Muslims of Pakistan, Ramzan was a happier month, the month of the revelation and the foundation of the religion. So that was the program. The mosques in the evening with Mr. Shirwani and the docks and the Mecca-bound pilgrims in the morning. Mr. Shirwani said to me, I will tell you a story. Listen. An English lord had two sons. They started just like you. They thought they would travel and find out about Islam. So they traveled. They went to Ajmer in India, to the famous Muslim shrine there. And they began to study with a Muslim teacher. The teacher had two daughters. The two sons of the English lord became Muslims and married the two daughters of the teacher. When you become a Muslim, you will remember this story. English lords, double marriages, Arabian kings with 500 servants for one month. In Karachi, already with camels, dwarfs and Africans, the Arabian nights came easily. In the evening, Mr. Shirwani came for me with a junior colleague and we went in the office van to some of the mosques of Karachi. The junior colleague was silent. Mr. Shirwani did the talking and I felt that for him it was a good way of easing himself into the long night of prayer, going from mosque to mosque and in between talking of the faith to someone who had volunteered to listen. The mosques were crowded and lit up. Fluorescent tubes were used decoratively. 
Sticks of blue-white glinter and strings of colored bulbs were hung over walls like illuminated carpets. Breathless recitations in Arabic from the Quran, some of the mullahs showing off how well they knew the book, how fast they could recite it, how little they needed to draw breath. They were followed by expositions in Urdu, and at every mosque, like a bee sipping from every flower, Mr. Shirwani prayed, and whenever the opportunity offered, joined in the responses of the congregation. Islam was each man's salvation. It was also the truth itself, the Prophet's story. It was also the community, stitched together by innumerable communal acts and occasions. Unity, faith and discipline, that was the theme of Islam, Mr. Shirwani told me. And it was only later that I learned that he had borrowed the words from Mr. Jinnah, the founder of Pakistan. Something else underlay the feeling of community, anxiety about the hereafter. It was important, it was fundamental. It locked all the components of the faith together. The anxiety, whether on doomsday, one was going to torment or to bliss. Mr. Shirwani said that by his own pious exercises, he had been given the merest glimpse of the hereafter. The truly pious could see further. Mr. Shirwani was steadily losing his joviality, his wish to explain. The prayers were holding him more and more, and soon, like a man who grudged the time, he took me back to the hotel and hurried away. On this night of revelation, when prayers were so precious, Mr. Shirwani intended to pray right through until the morning fast began. To be a devout Muslim was always to have distinctive things to do. It was to be guided constantly by rules. It was to live in a fever of the faith and always to be aware of the distinctiveness of the faith. But the world was going on. Another revelation was being prepared that night. And in the morning, it burst on us in a big front-page story in the government paper, the morning news. Plot to make Pakistan a foreign stooge. Benazir's bid to arrange US-backed coup. Photostat copy of Letter to Murtaza released. What was reproduced in six full columns of the paper were letters from Mr. Bhutto's daughter Benazir to her brother in London. They were written from that house the taxi driver had shown me. One letter had been written nine days before the hanging of Mr. Bhutto, another four days before the hanging. They were family letters, and it was a violation to expose them. They were suggestions from a sister to a brother about what might be done in the way of petitions and pressure to save their father. The burden of the morning news story was that in return for American help in saving her father, Benazir Bhutto was offering to give up the Pakistan nuclear program. The handwritten letters were presented as evidence, but they were poorly reproduced and no transcription was given, and in fact, the newspaper story was a fabrication. It was the other side of the life of faith. The faith was full of rules. In politics, there were none. There were no political rules because the faith was meant to create only believers. The faith could not acknowledge secular associations or divisions. For everyone in open political life, Islam was cause, tool and absolution. Mr. Shirwani must have had enough of me, or perhaps more official duties had claimed him. I found, when I went to Mr. Dean's office in the morning, that another officer were to go with me to the docks to see the pilgrims leave for Mecca. The officer was a young woman in a green sari. She was slender, almost thin, and her English was precise. She had unusually taken a degree in journalism at the University of Karachi. Afterwards, she had passed the examination for the Pakistan civil service, and after that, there had been an eight-month civil service course. She hadn't chosen information. She had been allotted to the department, and she found it frustrating. In information, she just had to do whatever she was given to do. It wasn't good enough for someone who had done a degree in journalism and wished to do proper writing. She said all this quite openly in Mr. Dean's office, and she wasn't speaking to impress me or Mr. Dean. She was as unhappy and tense as her thinness suggested. And I wondered why. As important as the Federal Civil Service was in Pakistan, she kept on with the job. I asked what her husband did. She said all her family were service people. 
army people and her husband too used to be in the service used yes her husband was dead he expired in a helicopter crash her husband's family gave some financial help now but she did the job because she needed the money especially for the education of her children she was educating them in english as well as in urdu because in foreign countries and she meant saudi arabia and the muslim countries you couldn't get a job unless you spoke english so already she was training her children to leave pakistan to become emigrants she said i have to we are a minority we are non muslims she was wearing a sari did that mean she was a hindu or a parsi before i could ask she said we believe in the prophet but 3 years ago we were declared non muslims by the government we are ahmadis but why did they declare you non muslims what were the pressures on them you must ask benazir bhutto benazir will tell you why her father declared us non muslims he was very friendly with us and then he went and did that the sect began she said with a man called ahmed who was born in northern india in the last century in 1890 he came to the realization by many signs given to him that he was the mahdi or the promised messiah he was a pious man he fought the conviction but in the end could not resist it there were muslims who believed that the messiah wasn't going to come until doomsday but another interpretation of the prophecy was that the messiah would appear when islam had degenerated and in 1890 islam had degenerated I said so you're like the Bahais of Iran they believe that the hidden imam or someone like him appeared in the last century but she had never heard of the Bahais she was an Ahmadi convert and the Ahmadis themselves she told me were divided some like herself believed in the successor to the messiah others did not but how had she a muslim come to accept this idea of the messiah the idea was hateful to muslims muslims believed that muhammad was the final prophet this idea of the indian messiah came close to denying that finality and therefore came close to denying something fundamental about the prophet as a muslim she would at one time have felt horror at the idea how had she managed to make the jump well she said her parentage was mixed she was shia on one side orthodox sunni on the other so she was ready it might be said for heterodox belief and she had married an ahmadi it was necessary therefore for her to become one her see then was something that had been given to her something she had seen approaching and had deliberately embraced her husband had talked to her instructed her and she was now so convinced a believer that she spoke of the messiah ahmed with a little tremor the good man the pious man who had had messiahhood forced on him and couldn't deny the many signs of god mr salahuddin the newspaper editor had the reputation of being an islamic hardliner he was a small man in his early 40s he had a gray streaked spade beard a precise mouth and bright black eyes He was born in India and had come to Pakistan when he was 12. Muslims were free to worship in India, he said. It wasn't just for the freedom of worship that Pakistan was established. Pakistan was meant to be an Islamic state, run on Islamic principles. What did that mean? Had there been such a state? He said, "The state that existed for 32 years at the time of the Prophet and the first four caliphs." So there it was again. the dream not only of the early islamic state the creation of the prophet but also of the time when muslims were rightly guided divinely ruled a fusion of history and theology the indestructible alloy of the faith that pure time could come again muslims could live in such purity again they had only to follow the rules the rules were there they could be found in the holy book and the traditions The many rules of Islam were not handed down for the sake of God, Mr. Salahuddin said. They were for the good of people. Freedom came with obedience. The rules made men free. 
and in his office in Karachi with men coming in all the time on newspaper business, some of them with bundles of rupees and with the calligraphers at their long desks in the next room preparing their copy for the press. That was Mr. Salahuddin's cause, the Islamic State and its special freedom. He had gone to jail in Mr. Bhutto's time. I felt he was ready to go to jail again. The poet Muhammad Iqbal, when he had put forward his idea for a separate Indian Muslim state in 1930, had spoken of a Muslim polity or social order as something arising naturally out of the Islamic principle of solidarity. Such a polity existed in Pakistan, but the Islamic state of which people now spoke was more abstract than Iqbal's. This Islamic state couldn't simply be decreed, it had to be invented. And in that invention, faith was of little help. Faith at the moment could supply only the simple negatives that answered emotional needs. No alcohol, no feminine immodesty, no interest at the banks. But soon in Pakistan, these negatives were to be added to. No political parties, no parliament, no dissent, no law courts. So existing institutions were deemed un-Islamic and undermined or undone. The faith was asserted because only the faith seemed to be whole. And in the vacuum, only the army could rule. Ahmed was taking me to dinner at his house and I went down to the lobby of the Intercontinental to wait for him. As soon as I sat down on the sofa, a young man, whom I had barely noticed, left where he was sitting and threw himself next to me with a movement so sudden, violent and intimate that I was startled. He wore the long Pakistani shirt and loose cotton trousers. He had the squat physique and the round face of the taxi driver who had driven me around Karachi. His English was thick and hard to follow. Cafeteria, he was whispering. Where is cafeteria? I pointed to where the coffee shop was, but he wasn't interested, he said. Nothing else here? Upstairs? Rooms. Rooms? Only rooms? You live here? For a few days. Only rooms, eh? Pool? Where is pool? You know the pool? It's closed. Closed? This Islamic government closed it. The lobby was busy. The foreign air crews, the principal users of the Intercontinental, came and went. One tall, young German girl, lusciously hipped, with her hair in a ponytail at the side, was attracting the young man's attention. He said, Woman is God's gift to man, you think? Yes, you come here a lot. My first time. And it turned out that he had been in the lobby for only 25 minutes. He had come with a friend, that older, thinner man in a brown country outfit on the other chair. The young man besides me said, We come to see the traffic. He said he was a student. I asked what he studied. He said he was really a shopkeeper. He had said he was a student because he wanted to be a doctor. His family wanted him to be a doctor and do well. He was 24. He came from Sukur, which he said was 400 miles to the northeast. It was nearer. He sold cloths in Sukur. He had come down with his brother to Karachi to do a little business. He had done his business, he was a little bored, and the friend from Sukur on the other chair, more experienced in Karachi ways, had suggested they should come to the Intercontinental to see the traffic. A French group came out of the lift, a man and two women. The man was the true beauty in the group, slender, all in white, the toweling texture of his jersey contrasting with the smooth drill of his trousers. He remained standing, but one of the two women of his court sat next to the sleepy man from Sukur. He woke up, and sleepy-eyed as he was, wriggled until he was touching her. He knew about the traffic in the Intercontinental. He knew that foreigners and their shameless women, non-Muslims, could be treated with contempt as open as this. The woman took out some colour photographs from her bag. The man from Sukur leaned over the woman's shoulder to look. But the pictures were not as exciting as he had perhaps expected. And sleep began again to get the better of him. He stared vacantly ahead too exhausted to consider the traffic moving in and out of the lifts. I introduced Ahmed when he arrived. This was a misjudgment. Ahmed was of Pakistan, not a visitor, and he wasn't amused. 
He said, when we were in his car, that the men from Sukur, whom he had greeted ceremoniously, thinking they were friends of mine, were villagers, rustics. People like that came to the intercontinental to look at unveiled women and women in bikinis. They were rich Pakistanis who came for the same thing. They rented rooms that overlooked the pool. Palestinians, Muslims, had contributed to the craze. Some of them had come to Karachi with European women, who had lounged around in bikinis by the intercontinental pool, and the story had spread. For villagers like the men from Sukur, Ahmed had no regard. These were the men, villagers, who had got to know about the traffic at the intercontinental, had the coolness to defy the doormen, and thought they had understood the world, who became communists. Politics in Pakistan could be as simple as that. Ahmed said, I will tell you the story of this country in two sentences. In the first quarter of this century, the Hindus of India decided that everything that was wrong had to do with foreigners and foreign influence. Then in the second quarter, the Muslims of India woke up. They had a double hate. They hated the foreigners and they hated the Hindus. So the country of Pakistan was built on hate and nothing else. The people here weren't ready for Pakistan and people who don't deserve shouldn't demand. It was what many conservative Muslims said, that the Muslims of India, as Muslims, hadn't been pure enough for a Muslim state. Ahmed said, Then they began to distribute the property of the Hindus who had left Pakistan. So many of the people who had come here from India got something for nothing. That was the attitude in the beginning. That is the attitude today. And Ahmed and his other visitor agreed that people were turning to Islam because everything else had failed. Even at the universities, the Islamic wave was swamping academic life. But wasn't that the special trap of a place like Pakistan? Couldn't people now accept that they were Muslims in a Muslim country and that Pakistan was what the faith had made of it? Did it make sense after the centuries of Islamic history to say that Islam hadn't been tried? Ahmad became grave. He said, no, it has never been tried. And with that, we come to the end of episode number 17 of the Indologia podcast. Once again, the excerpts I was reading to you were from a book called Among the Believers by V.S. Naipaul. It is a fantastic exploration of the Islamic world by Mr. Naipaul. And it takes you on a journey through several Muslim countries, including Iran, Pakistan, Malaysia and Indonesia. And uh, the writer has delved very deep into the political, social and religious landscapes of these countries, offering insightful observations and reflections along with a lot of very interesting, sometimes funny, sometimes tragic anecdotes. I would highly recommend this book to you. If you're interested in uh, any of these countries, or if you're interested in the general subject of Islam, I would say please give this a read. It is a wonderful, neutral exploration of the Islamic world. Among the Believers by Mr. V. S. Naipaul. I hope you've liked this podcast, and if you did, then please consider giving me a nice and good rating on Apple Podcasts and on Spotify as well. You should also follow me on all these social media platforms. The name is Indologia. It's the same everywhere. I-N-D-O-L-O-G-I-A. I'm on WhatsApp, Twitter, or rather X, Instagram, YouTube, everywhere. So please do follow me. If you have any suggestions, any feedback, any critique, please message me on Instagram. And till the next time I see you, Jai Hind, Vande Mataram.